All right. So, chapter eight this was. Human society. Yeah. What's today? March 13th? 13th, yeah. 2019. So it's about like a quarter of the way through the book. Yes. And we're about a quarter of the way through the year. Quarter through the so. year. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, this was a much easier chapter than the last one, I thought. Yeah, I think so too. Um, but like it, I mean, it definitely went over a lot. So it was easier to understand, but there's a lot to absorb. It was another one of those foundational uh, chapters where it was mm -hmm. like, here's stuff you already know, restated, fo like formulaically. It's yeah. Like, Humans live in society. Right. And that means we do certain things together. And why do we do that? It's division of labor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but then, I mean, he went, he covered. He talked about God, he talked about liberalism, he talked about anarchist, anarchist. he talked about, yeah. there was a lot, and then Ricardo's theorem. Um, yeah. Yeah. Compared to cost. So let's go through it. Okay. Uh, Section one, human cooperation. Uh, what is society? It says it right there. I ripped it this through the book, though. He says, it says in the book, in this study guide, society is nothing but the combination of individuals for co cooperative effort. But the exact quote in the book is, the total complex of the mutual relations created by such a concerted, by such concerted actions. Which I thought was a really cool sentence. <laughs> um, <laughs> I kind of understand it. My understanding is it's just, it's just like ev everyone has individual actions and the summation of that is society. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, so society can't act. It's individuals that act and change society. Exactly. Why did cooperation in society emerge, according to Mises? What role did division of labor play? Um, I think it's because um, man benefits when they cooperate. They're incentivized to do so. And by dividing up the labor um, came specialization. And specialization led to better lives so we continue to do it yeah he he said all, uh, something to the effect of like the, um this this cooperation and division of labor is almost what it means to be human like with humans have never existed as the sole providers of everything in their life mm -hmm. um who would always interact with other people socially to achieve mutually beneficial goals. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, two, a critique of the holistic and metaphysical view of society. Why and under which conditions does an individual substitute concerted action for isolated action? How is this opposed to the holistic doctrines? Why and under which conditions does an individual substitute concerted action for isolated action? Um, gee, I don't know. I would imagine in a situation in which he can't find somebody to do a, a job. What's concerted mean? Concerted, like in a concert, together. Oh, okay. I, I, I presume. I'm not, oh, I'm not okay. exactly certain. Uh, wait, why under which Okay, so there's... There are three... I guess when it's more beneficial. Oh, I think I was reading it backwards. Why and under which conditions says an individual substitute concerted action for isolated action. So previously they did isolated action and now they do concerted action. Mm -hmm. It's because it's it's in what 
um, conditions. Um, the condition that someone else can produce something more effectively than the person could produce it themselves if they uh, each specialize. Right. I think there was there's three conditions. I think that's in the division of labor section, so it I might be jumping ahead. It was that um, resources are dispersed around the world unevenly. Men are unequal. Yeah, men are unequal and can do different things differently. Mm-hmm. And the third one was uh, oh the fact that some tasks are beyond the power of a single worker. Yes. Okay. How does this oppose the holistic doctor? Um, I think the holistic doctrine is that. Um, Is that where there's like a, a master god that says this is how everything needs to be produced? Oh, okay. And that's not how it is. It's, it's not that there's a... Um, right, there's not like just a divine way to do something. Yeah, short-sighted and wicked individuals had to be forced to sacrifice their own selfish interests in order to achieve the greater plan. Like, no, it's not that way. It's that people come up with their own plans. So why is society a product of human action? Um, because it is a result of individuals seeking to um, achieve an end um, using a means with other people. The, yeah. So has society been designed by humans? Well, I would say no, because the word design implies a central plan. Right. Yeah, I think it, it's it's uh, it's effect. It, society is a, an effect caused by human action, but it's not designed by it. Right. What is the essential problem of all the variants of collectivist ideas? Um, individualism? Yeah, I think it, 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 it forsakes the individual. Right. That um, all people must surrender their will to the will of some other man um, who has some superior knowledge or something. What is Mises' perception of anarchism? Now, this I thought was interesting. My ears perked right up. Under technical notes, it says, People often ask, was Mises an anarchist? As the discussion on pages 148 to 49 makes clear, the immediate answer is no. However, a closer reading shows that Mises here used anarchism to mean lack of law enforcement. Nowhere does Mises discuss why the state must produce law, police, and military defense. He simply assumes that these are the proper functions of the state, and since they are necessary for society, therefore, Mises argues, the state is necessary. See, he... Wait, I guess you just said it. Like, he, um... Yeah, because he says the state is necessary for the... the narrow... like, the long tail of, you know, uncooperative humans. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that um, people do things that are antisocial, like mm -hmm. murder mm -hmm. um, and stealing, but that the benefits of not murdering and stealing are generally much better. So people are internally motivated not to do them. They don't need an outside body to tell them not to do it if they know that 
gee, if I m am a murderer, people aren't going to sell me meat at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But in absence of like intellect <laughs> or the foresight to know the consequences of one's actions, then a, a law enforcement mechanism is, is necessary mm -hmm. in his view. Although, as M Robert Murphy points out correctly, that uh, Mises leaves out... It, it, he doesn't even approach the argument that um, these types of services could be provided absent a state. Yeah, he talks about... Okay, so I guess that's not... So in what way does his definition of the state differ from that of the socialist? Well, there was a, a previous question that we skipped over. Oh, uh, did I? What is the role of democracy according to Mises? What does he think about majorities? So he said, the role of democracy is to select a ruler mm -hmm. peacefully because majorities of people, masses of people, are going to get the ruler that they want however that is going to happen. And so it's the responsibility of the intelligent minority to advocate for ballots rather than bullets because the majority is going to get what they want anyway and this is a more peaceful way to bring about the same result. Mm -hmm. And like so we mentioned like the problem with majority rule because you only have to get the majority and then you don't have to um, think about the minority. Yeah. You have the majority rule. Yes, yeah, but I think that he also is a saying that this is a more desirable outcome than um, majority rule by violence. He's like, there's going to be majority rule either way. Like, so it should be through voting rather than through force. Right. I wish I could run... Towards the end of the chapter, or maybe three quarters of the way, he, he said something, like... Because I didn't really know the definition of, like, classical liberalism mm -hmm. before this chapter. Yeah. And, like, it sounded great, and then... I forget what he... Like, he kind of threw a wrench in it, like, the big... The problem with liberalism. Mm, I don't know. I wish I wrote it down. Maybe I'll think about he it. He did talk about classical liberalism a bit. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would think that... I've heard of Mises referred to as a classical liberal. and I've heard of people who follow... Austrian economics refer to themselves as classical liberals. Mm -hmm. And I refer to myself here in Portsmouth as a classical liberal, much to the disappointment of the Democrats who picked up on what that word actually means, or what that term means. Yeah, like that's why I had to say classical, because the, the liberal they talk about in this book has nothing to do with the Democratic Party. Definitely no. not. <laughs> no. And, uh... I tried to use that word sneakily, you know, almost deceptively, to yeah. say I'm a classical liberal, which is like, it seems like on its face, look, I'm a liberal, you're a liberal, I'm just like more old school about it or something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. In what ways does his definition of the state differ from that of the socialists? Um, so, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what he said about social... He definitely had a definition of it. The state's job was to... I forget the... Probably it, it protect law and, and property and stuff, and the socialist is like, mm -hmm. the state's job is to do everything. Yeah. That would be my guess. I don't know. Yeah, I think... Yeah, cause, like, they definitely talk about property rights a little bit. Um, There's a comment here. Liberalism has full confidence in man's reason. It may be that this optimism is unfounded, 
and that the liberals have erred. But then there is no hope left for mankind's future. Well put. Three, the division of labor. Why is the division of labor more productive than isolated subsistence? So, you know, specialization, I think. Um, well, if for a couple of reasons. It's like some people are just better at other things. Yep. And then special specialization, if, you know, I can spend all my time making wooden chairs, I'm going to get really good at making wooden chairs. And then maybe, you know, someone's really good at, you know, cutting down timber, getting the best high quality wood for my chairs. Yeah. And then like the more we go, um, I thought it was a good point. Like specialization leads to uh, mechanization and mm. maybe machines. Yes. Because without specialization, like you can't, like there's no such thing as a machine that does everything. The right. The machine does one specific thing. And so the more, and I think it's like pretty apparent now with like a lot of the automation is like, you know, there's a very specific thing a, robo a robot needs to do in a car factory and like that makes it possible. Just does that one thing every time. Right. That's a really good point. And I didn't see that in the, in the book, um, upon my reading. It, a machine can only come about through the specialization of an individual where you're like, look, you're going to put this one hubcap on every single time. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm sick of this. I think a robot can do this one stupid job. Right. The example given was, uh, I love this. This kind of blew my mind a little bit, even though maybe it's elementary and you knew this already, but it's worth it to trade even if someone is the best at everything. Even yeah. if you're the best chef and you can chop vegetables better than anybody, it's still worth your while to hire vegetable choppers yeah. who suck because you can focus on doing other stuff and then yeah. and trade and you all benefit from that. I don't think he focused on time enough as like, that's why it's because there's time. If there's an infinite amount of time, mm. then you wouldn't need to, if you're the best at everything, you wouldn't need to, because you wouldn't yeah. just do it. But, but you have limited time, you're making a meal or whatever, and yeah. And then, but then to your point that you just made about mechanization is like a vegetable chopper, they have like machines for that now, probably because people like this great chef hired off. Yeah. Other people to do stupid vegetable chopping. Mm -hmm. The Ricardian Law of Association. What does the Law of Association show with regard to division of labor? I mean, I think it's what you just said. It's worthwhile to trade even if you're good at, you're the, the best at producing. Um, both when in the considering two products you're better at producing both of them it's still worthwhile to trade hmm that's what they call the Ricardian law of association yeah okay and that's the it's also called the comparative um, the law of comparative cost ah okay I'm upset looks like we have a math problem Consider the following example. Note that Sally is more productive in both lines. So we have a chart with one unit of P, one unit of Q. Joe can do it in three hours and two hours respectively. Sally can do it in two hours and one hour respectively. If Joe and Sally each give 60 hours to producing P and 60 hours to producing Q, what would each get to consume in isolation? So, so Joe 180, or no, I'm sorry, 20p, 
and 30Q. And Sally would be 30P and 60Q. So, yeah, Joe would have, so in 60 hours, Joe would have 30P and... Joe would have 20P. 20P and 30Q. Mm -hmm. And Sally would have 30P and 60Q. That makes sense. All right. Is there a way they could cooperate so that with the same expenditure of 120 hours each, they each consumed more of both goods than was possible without trade? Hint, suppose that Joe specializes entirely in the production of good pee. Okay, so Joe would produce 40 P and Sally would produce 120 Q. That's interesting. The, the, the hint was not what initially I suspected, like, uh, intrinsically, that Sally should specialize in producing the thing that she does the absolute best. I was thinking that to get the overall best... Well, she does. Yeah, I know. Sally, Sally produces Q the best. Right. So and that was not my that was oh. not my initial in inclination. I was thinking, well, Joe is better at producing Q, so maybe put his use to time the best doing Q, because Sally can do so much in with P. Why, but no. Why do you say Joe is the best at producing Q? Well, Joe is is better at producing Q than P. Um, it takes. How do you know that? Because it takes him two hours versus three hours. Right, but you you have to look at ratios. Right. Yeah. So Joe is, I guess, fifty percent worse at producing Q, <laughs> and thirty three percent worse at producing P. So Joe produces P better than he produces Q. Yes. And so. Sally produces P56. So they're both like, so the, so Joe is actually better at producing, he's less worse at producing P <laughs> to Sally than yes. he is to Q. Yeah. Oh, that was fun. What is the difference between the law of association and the law of comparative cost? Oh, uh, wait, I thought, I you thought just said they it. were the same thing, so. Mm, perhaps we should revisit that. Ricardo is credited with the discovery of the law of association or the law of comparative cost. Oh, come on. That was a trick question then. It sounds like it. Although it is obvious that cooperation can make two people better off, uh, Ricardo took the argument a step further. Even if one person is superior producing everything, even so he benefits from cooperating with the inferior partner. Yeah, I think that there is no difference. I think it's the same thing. It's a restatement. Uh, trick, trick question. question. How does the law of association relate to free trade? Oh, well, it presumes that goods can travel uninhibited. It would not be worthwhile if there was a 50% tax on Joe's labor and Sally had to um, pay that. Well, not necessarily. So if there's a 50% tax, that just means that the cost goes up. Yeah, she gets less P. It might not even be worth it to trade right. anymore. No, but so it just makes uh, Sally worse, worser at um, at producing the good, like net. Just the the good costs more. So it, I don't think it's that P 
Because, does that make sense? There's got to be some level of taxation at which it doesn't make sense for them to trade anymore. No, that's the, the law says that it's always worthwhile to trade. Yeah. So Don't it, it talks that. about the so it talks about the free movement of labor and capital. Yeah. So if it presupposes that you can trade though. There are some right. situations so, in which you can't. Okay. But I don't think it has to do with, like, so I, I think it, uh, it assumes that you, capital and labor can move. Right. The tax just, it makes the ratios worse off. I'm trying to think of the real world. So like, uh, law of association relate to free trade, where like, the factories producing pot in Colorado can produce a hell of a lot of pot but I can't get it here in New Hampshire. I can't get it in the quantities that I would be able to in New Hampshire. Right. Yeah, so you can't get it in New Hampshire, so it breaks down. Like, you guys wouldn't cooperate. At least. Right, we have to grow our own pot here. Yeah. We can't. We can't trade. No matter how inferior I am at doing it, I have to do it myself. <laughs> how does the mobility of factors of production affect Ricardo's law? So it was kind of interesting. They, like, so with the mobility of labor, then um, it it reaches an equal like wages will naturally reach an equilibrium on different so like let's say like labor was free to move between like you growing pot here and you growing pot in Colorado mm -hmm. but you know it's really mo it's way more expensive here for you to grow it than in Colorado because taxes and regulation or whatever um, but if you're free So initially, maybe like the person in Colorado will be making, I think I'm screwing this up, would be making a lot more money than you in wages. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I'm a little fuzzy on with this, but I, I really spent a lot of time trying to think about well, this. Well, follow through. I think I follow you. Okay. So you're making, you're free to move wherever. In New Hampshire growing pot, but yeah. you're making less. Yeah. So you're going to move to Colorado and grow pot to make more, and then there's less of the labor force. But I don't think that's the argument that I'm trying to make. I don't know. I think we, we covered... I, I, Ricardo's law definitely depends on the free movement of labor and capital. Yeah. Well, I th if, if I followed you correctly just now, yeah. the point that you were trying to make is if there's more profit, profitable, if I get paid more for my labor in Colorado than I do in New Hampshire, and then I will move to Colorado and get more, I will get paid more, which will reduce the supply of labor in New Hampshire and increase mm -hmm. the um, price of labor and until there's an equilibrium of labor so given free movement of people and factors of production yeah um, an equilibrium will be reached among uh, a, a product or a good or service yeah it's about what it was I don't think it's exact but it's close okay The effects of division of labor. Why does division of labor intensify the innate inequity in, of men? Because men, like, people have really strange talents, and the more, <laughs> the yeah. stranger this, like, the more, so the, 
the more the division of labor is, the more, you know, narrow your job is, and, like, so the more narrow your talent is, like, yeah, I don't know, think about, like, a, a fire dancer or something, like, some crazy, like, specialization, like, everyday guy, like, the everyday man, like, isn't gonna be able to do that, or it's, like, this is some weird, crazy one in a thousand talent, and, like, Maybe this is where it came up, or maybe it's in the next... I thought it was really profound, where, like, he talked about how, like, really society is grown by geniuses and, like, these outliers. So the broader the division of labor can be, the more, like, has, like, gateways that open up for geniuses. Mm -hmm. Like... You know, you can be a genius in coffee making or something, or a genius... Like, there's more different avenues where, like, genius can shine. Yeah, supposing every single person had to do every single job, we would right. all be very equally sucky at everything. Yeah. But since we get to specialize in the thing that we do the best, there gets to be a, a, a CEO of Starbucks and the uh, CEO of IBM, and people who specialize in these extreme yeah. things. And we become less equal. We can't all make coffee the same greatness. Yeah, I really like came on the thought that, at least from reading this chapter, is like, the world is kind of just built through all these geniuses, I guess. Seems that way, yeah. Yeah, and it seems like so, like, a good society is one that allows geniuses to flourish or, like, identifies them and flourish. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think that's a big, like, plus of, like, America. Like, if someone's, like, a great singer or, like, great at something, like, they get recognized and, like, they shoot up fast. Yeah. Whereas other places, like, I don't think it's like that. Yeah, I would agree with that. That seems to be a, a value here. The individual within society, what is the natural state of man? I don't remember that. Probably suckiness, just nothing. Natural state of man. being out in the world and oh man emerged as a social being there was never a time when what we would call humans lived in an asocial way praxeology deals with the isolated individual but that is only who understand the actions okay so social being yeah why is it romantic nonsense to praise the days of primitive barbarians Because um, the example they use in the books are these, you know, these two guys that were writing about how great it was back in the day. But you know, back in the day, like they would never have the opportunity to reflect like that on different people or write down those thoughts. Or hmm, I missed that. So he he says that they're. Yeah, so there's, like, these two French guys that, I, I don't know their names, but um, we're talking about how, like, we're fantasizing about a simpler time. And his point was, like, and they wrote books on this, and his point was that back in that simpler time, you wouldn't have the opportunity to write these books or come up with these thoughts or... Yeah. It just seems like if humans are progressively specializing, um, in order to produce more comfort and, like, pl things for themselves, 
yeah. then if we dial it back in time, then just like de, de facto, it had to be worse because we couldn't produce any of the great stuff that we want now. Like, yeah, there's these people called anarcho-primitivists who sort of view that as like the most ideal state of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. I just think they're totally wrong. I think the common one, which I can almost kind of think about, is, you know, a world where, without maybe cell phones, and so... Why would that be good? I don't, I don't understand. I mean, I, I can see, I don't know if I agree with it, but, you know, it's the fact that so, like, especially if you're addicted to your cell phone, which a lot of people are, or addicted to, you know, social media or something, where, you know, like... It's proven, like, if you spend a lot of your time on social media, like, you're generally unhappier than people who aren't. So people talk about, you know, going off the grid for a month, and they say, wow, that was great, it was very refreshing, and so, like, you can kind of see it. I don't know, that, that just is, like, um, blaming the item. That could have happened with anything. There were people right. who did buried in books back in the day. Yeah. Like, hey, put down the book. Or whatever. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, what was our point? What were we, oh, why is it romantic nonsense to praise the days of primitive barbarism? Uh, comment. The mystical experience of communion or community is not the source of societal relations, but the product. Uh, so exactly to your point, these guys, it's so great. The only reason we can even reflect on and have romantic feelings about the past is because we have the privilege of a, a spare time. Mm -hmm. The great society, why is peace preferable to war? I guess because it's more comfortable. Yeah, Is that well, right? I mean, war destroys things, and like we've learned in the book that um, like it's peace leads to cooperation, or maybe their cooperation and peace are the same thing. Yes. Um, I would say so. So. You know, and then we talked, like, without war, you don't, like, with war, you don't have division of labor. And it was kind of, it was kind of, like, interesting, the point he made where even, even when we, like, uh, you know, states go to war now, the fact that they don't completely annihilate, annihilate the enemy uh, means that uh, they still believe in they believe in the division of labor. Yeah, we do like co cooperation still. Right, because like, you know, if you go to war, like, I think they talk maybe like, you know, Europeans coming over to um, America and going to war with the Native Americans. Like, if they didn't believe in the division of labor, that like, that would mean that they should just annihilate all the Native Americans. But now that they enslaved instead, where right. they're like, we could actually use you. Yeah, and that they said that enslavement was kind of the first step to cooperation. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Robert Murphy summarizes here, Some writers extol the manly urges to kill and destroy that have allegedly been sapped by unnatural modern society. It may very well be that people thirst for bloodshed, but they also hunger for food and pang for fancy houses. Praxeology teaches that people must choose between these satisfactions. So war is, uh, so peace is preferable to war because it produces more of what we want, I think, put simply. Even if we really want war. What does society always imply with regard to human interaction? I think you said it, peace. Mm -hmm. 
cooperation is peace. The instinct and aggression of destruction, or and, and aggression, the instinct of aggression and destruction, what is meant by social Darwinism? Is this term still used today? So, modern liberalism does not rely on the false belief that men are created equal. Dar Darwinism does not in any way invalid oh, invalidate the liberal creed. On the contrary, the traits conductive to so social cooperation, rather than the allegedly natural instincts of aggression are precisely those that maximize one's offspring in the current environment. So, uh, yeah. So. Okay. That makes sense. Do you have a sen uh, something to say about that? No. I, I do. When I hear the term social Darwinism, it's usually people criticizing the doggy dog type of world where one species dominates and the other dies, but Mises seems to be pointing out that modern liberalism, it's not like that. Social Darwinism, it's, it's better for humans. We can produce more offspring more safely if we cooperate. Right. Uh, what dis distinguishes man from other animals? Uh, so fundamentally, it's reason, and a little bit more would be uh, the ability to sacrifice um, to your animal instincts. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. How did utilitarians show the cooperation is beneficial? For the most efficient and less efficient. So this is the law of comparative cost. I don't know the answer to this. So the, we did the math example. The law of Joe was less efficient to Sally. Um, Sally was more efficient in any aspects of the word. But, so it was definitely efficient for... Uh, Sally, and it was also efficient for Joe. Right. Okay, so it wasn't just Sally benefiting from using Joe. It was Joe and Sally both benefited from each other, even though one was the less efficient one. Why do utilitarians recommend equality under the civil law? Um, well, I would... I would wager that the utilitarians recommend equality under civil law because people should be treated equally, though they don't have equal abilities and, or nor equal outcomes. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, but. People, I don't know. I don't know exactly. What, what do you think? Why do they? What, um, what is this question getting at? They talked about maybe property rights come into play here, but like I don't. I don't really know. I don't remember this. Yeah, it doesn't look familiar to me. Um. Oh well. Sometimes there's a question we don't get. <laughs> well, chapter nine, the role of ideas. Cool. Um, this looks like a pretty short one. Is it? Yeah. Well, it might be worth it to do two if there are two short ones in a row. 
Yeah, looks yeah. like it. Let's do 9 and 10. Cool. Sweet. 